Welcome back to Tutorial Tidbits. I'm Elizabeth St. Hilaire, and this week I'm going to give you a sneak peek into my current project that's on the easel and my current lessons that are on patreon.com. So I've got in-depth tutorial videos from the very start all the way through the process to the very finish of collage on Patreon, but today I'm going to give you a sneak peek into one of the videos, uh, the one of the steps of the process that I'm doing right now on the flamingo that's been on my easel recently. So if you've got a few minutes to learn a few tips and tricks about collage application, then let's check it out. This week I wanted to give you a sneak peek into my current uh, multi-part lesson that is on my Patreon page and it is creating this flamingo with reflection in collage. So the first lesson um, involved the underpainting that published a couple weeks ago and then the most recent lesson involved creating the water with this collage, creating the water rings and applying all these beautiful colors coming into the pinks and tearing very thinly to create um, this watery reflection. So I work from the back to the front. So now that I've got this, um, also got this background area done plus the watery reflection, um, I have to now uh, create the flamingo part of the reflection um, or I can create the flamingo itself. It's just that where the beak hits this part of the watery watery reflection, the beak needs to go over the top. So because these are not really overlapping, when I work from back to front, I can now at this point do the this reflection or the actual flamingo. And I thought that what I would do for today's tidbit is just show you a little bit of collage application in the flamingo and how I follow my underpainting as my roadmap. Because I get asked a lot of times, why do you do a painting underneath if you're just going to put collage on top? So the lesson uh, that previously published in my, on my Patreon page showed um, how I really focus on the values, the lights and the darks, where is the highlight, where is the medium, where's the dark, where's the shadow, so that this flamingo stands out strongly from the background because the background is a lot of the same colors as the flamingo. So that lesson really detailed how I'm very careful with the values to make sure things stand out. So I thought I would then show you a little bit about how I apply collage over the underpainting. So I'm using my um, favorite brush, which is the Princeton Catalyst uh, number eight short handled filbert. Now that's a big long name for a very small brush, but basically filbert is the shape of the tip. So it's rounded corners, sort of tapered rounded. That's the shape filbert. Um, Princeton Catalyst uh, is, the, is the brand and it's a poly tip bristle. It's a very rigid bristle. It, it's very rigid and I need that because that is the tool that I use to press down with pressure and make sure my papers go very flat. So this is not only a, a, a tool for the glue, but the rigidity of these bristles is what I count on to be able to get my papers down flat. Um, I use the number eight because that's the size, the width of the brushes. That's the size uh, of this brush according to Princeton's sizing chart. And last but not least, I use the short handle because I keep the brush in my hand at all times. I tear the paper and I keep the brush in my hand. I don't put it down. So the long handle being another four or six inches out would be just in the way and cumbersome. So the way that I work uh, with my hands and not putting the brush down, holding it sort of like a chopstick um, and going back from this to this so that I can tear, that is why I prefer the short handle. Now this is my the only brush I use for collage glue application. It is on my Amazon uh, resource art supply shopping link, which is below. Um, I'm using um, gloss gel medium as my glue and I am using all of my pre-painted papers that I create mostly primarily on the gel press uh, along with my uh, own stencil designs. So the stencil designs that I use uh, to create the papers, that link is below and um, all the gel printing uh, products uh, that I use uh, for making paper are on my Amazon page. Okay, so let's get started. So. What I generally do once I get that underpainting down is I do what I call auditioning. I bring my paper up to the painting and I say, is this the right color and is it the right value? Now, when I hold it here to that color right there, 
it is both. It is the right color and the right value. So this paper could be used there. But when I hold it up here, I see that it is much too light and not the right color. So I call this the auditioning process. And this is how I use my underpainting to determine where the papers are going to go. And I mentioned that I work from back to front. So within the flamingo itself, this is all on one plane. Then I would add the eye and the face on top of that and the beak on top of that because this section is on top of the feathers. But feathers overlap as they go down. They're like fish scales. Feathers start from the head and work their way towards the tail like fish scales. So the best way to, to allow feathers to overlap as they go down is to work from the tail back up towards the feather, uh, the head, sorry. So when you work from the tail towards the head, your feathers are overlapping as they go towards the head. And then when you get to the head, you've got overlap, 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 overlap as they come down. So we're going to work from the tail up towards the head loosely and creating uh, feathery shapes that are going to overlap as they go down. So we'll do the body and then I will do the face and the beak. And obviously I'm just giving you a taste of this lesson as a tidbit. And I am going to, um, let you know that the full and complete lesson, like I said, from underpainting all the way through to finish on this are the types of tutorial in-depth lessons that you get on my Patreon page. So I am going to, um, I've got glue on the brush. I've got, uh, the paper in my hands. I'm going to tear a brush mark and because I'm not taking my own advice, I'm just going to put this here for now because I, I already auditioned that. And so just as an example, I put the glue down on the board, I put the paper into the glue. I use the brush to spread the glue flat, press. I wipe off any excess glue. And there you can see that you can't even hardly tell the difference between the painting and the paper. So the paper is following what was painted. So here's a, these peach colors are tricky and I may need to make more paper for this flamingo. Um, here's a fun sort of what you would, con you would look at and think this was a flamingo color. Um, when I audition it though, I think it's only gonna work in the lightest of areas. So maybe right here and up on this top edge. Um, so I'm looking now for some dark and this is sort of purple right here. I've got this paper that's sort of purple with orange, but it's too light. It could be used in some area. Now, when I when I take papers out that look like they could be useful somewhere, I'm going to put them on my easel shelf so I can find them easier later. So here's a, a, a paper with brown and orange, and it is very similar in value to the purple. I would like to find a paper that's got purple, but this is definitely going to be useful in the leg. Um and in some of these dark areas. So if I don't have one with a purple, and the reason I worry about that is, well, it's not gonna, it's all light here so that against that brown, it stands out really well. And then it's light out here, so this will stand out well. So if I don't find a one with a purple like I painted, that's okay. Then we get into the value. Is the value correct? Because the color can be off, but it needs to be dark enough. So right in here, it is dark like what I painted. It's also really good in the leg. So if I choose to use it as the leg paper, I maybe should use something different in here. And I definitely use purple to tint all of these darks. So let's see if I've got a purpley orange in my repertoire. And if I don't, then I need to stop and go make paper. Here's an orange with blue, but I think that blue is too intense. The purple is more muted. So there's a double color, a transitional double color, but it's not exactly right. Sometimes the back is applicable. And here in the back of this paper might definitely look good in some of these areas with the dark. It's not much, but it's a good match. So I'm gonna put that on the easel shelf and now I'm gonna grab the purple drawer and see if I can find some purple orange in the purple drawer. Here I've got some muted purple it doesn't have orange in it, but it is really close to the coloring that's going on here in some of this dark. So I'm going to, again, uh, working uh, from the tail end and up, I put the glue down, I tear the paper without white edges in an organic sort of brush mark shape, and then I'm gonna press that 
let's start back here, into the glue and press over the top. Now that's too dark for right there where I put it. It's darker than what I painted. And I need to remember that I made great detailed underpainting. So I think that this color really, the value of it is the best right in here. The audition shows that that's the best place for it. And that's also a great dark color to stand out on the edge against this color. So I'm gonna give it one more piece of that paper. Now you don't wanna use the same paper over and over um, because it becomes redundant and they blend together, but this is such a great piece that I'm just gonna finish that S curve with it, pressing it down with the brush and removing excess glue. So now I'm gonna see if I can find another piece so I may not find purples with orange on them, but I've got plenty of sort of muted purples. This is very busy on the front, but this is a color, a paper where the color soaked all the way through. And look at that. It is really perfect for up there. And remember that the what's on the back side is sometimes more usable than what's on the front side of your rice papers and papers that soak all the way through. So here's uh, an orangey salmon type paper. It's got a little bit of texture on it here. It's got a little bit of purple right there. So let's hold that up and see. It's still too bright for this area, although out towards here, it's good. And maybe in here, in somewhere like this, it's good because of the little bit of purple on it. If it didn't have the purple on it, it's so light, it, it would be a light color, but the front side is a little darker and it's got a little bit of purple. So I think that's gonna look good up in here, considering we're working on from the tail up. And I'm gonna put that right in here. Now it's really good right there, but it's overlapping into a slightly darker area. So I'm gonna overlap it right here to make sure that I'm I'm in the same value of what I've painted. So I'm going to come back here with this same paper and do a little piece right there. So now I've got the same value. So I'm going to jump around a little bit just for the point of demonstrating. And I'm going to use this one on the back side, like we talked about, because right in here, this is a a nice piece that's got bluish purple and orange on it. So it would be a good transitional color. Now transitional color is when the orange blends to the dark purple in between is a transitional color that helps it to be a softer blend. That's this kind of paper, a color with both colors, a paper with both colors on it. So it's got purple and it's got orange and it blends in the middle. So I'm gonna take this piece and I'm gonna make use of that as my transitional color right here as the purple is going to the orange. So I've got that down. I'm gonna set that uh, off to the side on the easel because that's a really good piece. And then I'm going to audition and see that this orange would be really perfect right in here and also a little bit up. So there, my transitional blend probably could be worked again. So I'm gonna come back in with another piece and put that over the edge of the orange and try to make that a little visually softer. That orange might be a little too intense. So there's a difference. There's, there's color and value, but then there's also intensity. And that's the vibrancy, the brightness. So sometimes it's the right color and it's the right value. But if it's a very vibrant color, it tends to come forward. So I'm feeling like that orange might be a little too intense there. And that might be why. So I'm going to come to this sort of peachy and hold that up and see if some of that next to it might help. sort of to subdue the intensity a little bit. Here's another one, but that's too light. That is a good color for up here. Not all the way up though, because it's super light up there, but sort of on the light edge. But still with this, here's another orange that is less intense. So that's 
that's this versus that. So you can see that sort of in here, this one is more intense. This is a little more subtle. It's a little less vibrant. So let's put that over this a little bit. And that's all beginning to create some lovely brush marks in there of the back and forth between the orange and the transitional color and the dark shadow color. So I'm going to grab a little bit more of this with the blue on it and put that sort of up in here. To create more painterly transition colors, it gets darker as it goes up into the corner of the neck. So we can come back and look at... Again, that's too busy, but the back side of it is nice with a little bit of the pattern showing through. And we can put that right in here in the darkest part of this bend. And the feathers, of course, are following the curve of the flamingo. So we're going to follow our brush marks. We're going to look at the way the brush marks went, and we're going to tear pieces of paper that mimic brush marks in their shape and direction. So we would never do vertical pieces because that's not following the form. So we're gonna go this way and curve around and go that way, the same way the feathers would follow the body of the flamingo. So that gets dark in the corner and there's almost a little bit of red in there, the way that I painted it, right in this bend. And here's a red that matches that nicely. I'm gonna tear a curved piece. I'm gonna flip it around and get the white edge off. And I am gonna put that right in the bend. And that looks great. So my next step is to go a little, if I'm following around here, I'm not exactly, I'm jumping around a little bit for the point of demonstrating. I'm flattening down this piece because it's bubbling up a little. You're gonna keep your, your eye on previously placed pieces to be sure that they're not bubbling, buckling up. And when if they do, you're gonna use the brush to press them down. So let's put this leg in because ultimately the leg tucks under the body. So when we come in here with the rest of the feathers, we need the top of this leg to be already established because we're working from the back to the front. So do I have to make the top of the leg up out of all one piece perfectly torn? No, because when you glue multiple pieces of the same paper next to itself, as long as there's no white edges, they visually become one piece. So I can create that top leg out of multiple pieces of dark purple because they're going to blend together to form one piece if they are the same paper. And that is the reason why you don't want to keep gluing the same paper next to itself over and over and over because visually you will lose your brush marks and it will become one big flat solid because the same paper glued next to itself will visually become one. And that is why I am always switching papers because I want the individual brush marks to stand out and they won't stand out if you glue the same paper next to itself over and over. So that's a little jumpy from the red to this, uh, to that. It's a little dunk, 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 and that's, it needs to be softer. So the problem is, is that this is a little too light. So I've got to come in here and find my purple that I said I was going to set aside, or maybe I just used it all. Oh, here's that brownish that we were going to use. So I've got to darken down that middle section of the leg. Here's a pink, pink purple with some pattern on it that could be kind of neat in that leg. Let's put that up in there. That's the right value. And let's blend this together. And again, we don't want to do the whole thing in that same color, but we need to keep them all in dark values. So I'm going to jump down a little lower with that same paper. And then I'm going to come back with the purple without white, without the white pattern on it. I think that was just a wee bit too light. And I'm going to get rid of that red in the middle because that's too intense. The red is too intense. You can see that this is jumping out. It's not being subtle because it's intense. It's dark, but it's intense. So I'm going to go over that with a, with a less intense kind of dark purple. I'm going to blend the top here. Here I've got this piece with 
the dark purple and the red. So I'll get rid of the red and sort of put that up here. So now you can see it's dark and it's softer. It's not so chunk, chunk, chunk. So I have to keep my, my eye on intensity, value, and color. So I'm going to come down and I um, overlap the water into this leg. And then you can see the benefit of working from back to front because the water is con con coming into this leg and gone over it. And when I lay the leg on top, I'm going to have a nice, perfect edge of the leg against the edge of the water with no gap. So that is the benefit of working from the back to the front. So let's see. Here's a paper. I, it's not really paper. It's some kind of weird fabric-y material, and it only rips vertically. It won't rip horizontally. Um, it's brown, but it's also got orange, and I'm wondering if that would be a good color for this. Not really, because it's not purple enough, because right now I'm in this sort of purpley pink family. So let's keep working with what we have here. Let's use a little bit more of this. So I'm going vertical on these pieces because my brush marks on the leg are vertical. And then I'll follow it down, covering up until I get to the point of where it intersects the water and then this becomes the reflection. And then there needs to be a change in the color of this part of the leg so that you visually know it's no longer the flamingo leg. It meets the water and this is the reflection. So this is actually even darker and it's wiggly along the edges so that you can know. And I I'm, I'm probably would increase that wiggle just a little bit when I glue down. So that's the leg so far for now. And then let's come back and look at this orangey brown paper and say, hey, that would be really good in the not as dark areas. So it's a little too dark for that, but it's good in this sort of bend next to that purple. So I'm gonna tear a curved brush mark and glue that down right here pressing the glue down from all directions. And I'm gonna curve this, change this direction so it curves a little bit more towards the head. And I've got two pieces and start to build the bend in here. So, so far I'm doing pretty well without having to paint papers. It's always easier to, to, to work with what you have on hand, but um, you can't force it if you don't have the right colors at all. I mean, a flamingo is not pink. If I hold up pink, this is what we think of as pink. That's not a flamingo color at all. It's really orange, salmon, peach. I do have a decent amount of those colors. It's not yellow orange, so that's not gonna work. Here's an orange with red striations and even a little blue on it. This is probably a little too intense because of the yellow that's in it. So again, this is the auditioning. This is the underpainting is my roadmap, my guide. And it also allows me to have sometimes if there's a little gap in between papers, the underpainting comes through rather than white. And if you leave some or miss some spaces, the painting works with you. So that's the beginning of my Patreon lesson. I'm going to keep recording and um, finish this entire piece in a multiple different uh, sessions. And that is how my Patreon page is structured. Um, they are in-depth tutorial video lessons that publish every week. So if you're interested, check me out. The link's below. And happy Friday. Thank you for being here.